to cover, and one of them will involve Lecture Note 4, which will involve your next homework assignment. Uh, I'm not going to be able to talk about the midterm exam today, uh, mainly because we have some extensions that are going through Friday. So until next week, we won't be able to, to talk about them. But otherwise, we'll post solutions. I do understand there were some technical challenges with taking out an Elms. Uh, I was just talking to one of my TAs. They are going to look at your file submissions if, if somehow uh, the data was not correctly graded by Canvas. Uh, so for example, if you have a negative sign or something like that, you'll end up getting credit for that. Right? Or you should be able to get credit if you can point that out to them. Okay. So as long as you have the correct file submitted that was balanced, that's going to be the most important thing in terms of the grade. So, uh, a couple things I was asked about today. Uh, one was, how are we doing in our stock simulation rankings? So, just to make sure we all know that, if you go to either T-Message or IDEA in a Bloomberg terminal, you need to select from the drop-down uh, your section. So, is this 301? Are you guys section 301? 201. So let's see. Shared views. This one? Yeah. All right. Update. All right. So here you are. Now, I'm, it's going to be based on portfolio value. So again, I don't count. I only made one trade in the first day of class. But as of today, we have this team, Jay Brady. Here's Jay Brady in here. Congratulations, your team is in first place. Uh, a million, 11,000. Now, I mean, don't get too excited. You're, you're by 4,000, so a lot can change in one day. But nonetheless, this is the way we would score as of today. And a couple teams have made a lot of trades. Like, this team has made 19 trades already, uh, where most teams have made just a few. Remember, this number has to be more than 10 over the first half of the semester. Yes? What relative profit? Uh, this is relative to the S&P 500 or, or some index, but we're not doing that. It's just pure. The only one that matters for our grading purposes is how well you do against uh, your peers. So just relative performance here, portfolio value. Right? And again, we can see, now you won't see this data, but for example, you know some teams haven't really deployed a lot of cash yet. So they made some trades, they just haven't spent much. Others have spent a lot. But regardless, this can change, but this is how we're going to score you. Now, the one thing you won't see, I have administrative rights, so I'll see all the team names. You'll just see a bunch of, like, pound signs, hashtags. Okay, so they'll gray it out. But you'll see the, the order. You just won't know who's in first place or who's in last place, unless you're that team. So here you'll actually see team names, the names of people in the team. All right, so that's uh, training competition. The one question that I did ask, get asked about, so I'll go to mine, is when I did in the first day of class, I bought some Google. It hasn't made a lot of money in the couple weeks we've owned it. So again, to close out a position, which is to sell it, you click on this red X. Okay. So when you look at your specific list of, of companies, whoever your portfolio team leader is, when they go in to sell, you click on the red X, and that will bring up close idea, which when you do this, is the trading screen to sell. Okay, so that's how you sell. And again, remember the 24-hour holding period. So if you buy it today, the red X won't be visible. It'll be like a shield or something like with a little, you know, no, little, like a don't cross line that you basically can't sell. So the red X only shows up after you've held it for one trading day. So that's how you can close out a position. There. Or if you're short, that's how you'd cover. All right, it's called closing the idea in Bloomberg Link. All right. So the other thing <clears throat> that I would like to mention is as I said, we're going to have kind of a three-part assignment that's going to be due on Monday, and we're going to cover each of the three parts. Okay, And the first part of the assignment is going to be an operating ROIC. So I'm going to go back to, now this is on the video, it's in the book, and it's covered on the conversion of the midterm, but I want to cover just briefly, conceptually, one of the key points that came up. So this screen here, is just kind of a graphical representation of ROIC. And there's two ROICs. There's the, it's called the traditional ROIC, or the, the calculated ROIC Bloomberg and Wall Street uses, you learn in the academic world. And then there's the class version called operating ROIC, which is McKinsey's version. What's the basic difference between the two? Just conceptually. The ROIC and what I'll call operating ROIC. Yeah. Traditional have both operating and non 
operating trust capital to operating loan includes whether you store day to day basis. Exactly. And that, it sounds simple, but that's a very fundamental difference that he just answered. So good answer. So let's just go a little deeper. So here's the thing. It's basically a simplistic view of traditional operating ROIC, because what is it? Metaphor. You buy a house for $500,000, it requires $500,000 worth of financing. You buy a house for $600,000, it requires $600,000 worth of financing. More house, more financing. More assets, more financing. More invested capital, invested in property, plan, equipment, and stuff, more financing, more debt and equity. So traditionally, what they've said is, okay, you have your assets minus your non-interest-bearing liabilities is invested capital, and that equals debt and equity. And so here's the thing. I am the investor. I gave you the debt and equity. I don't really care whether you made something as an operating profit or a non-operating profit. I just want profit. Like if, if you made it because you sold a bunch of assets and they got a profit on it, great. If you made it because you sold more widgets and got a margin on it, great. I want more money. I prefer that you do from operations, but at the end of the day, pay me. Okay? You didn't make it up in your operations, find it someplace else, pay me. That's the way investors think. Just pay me. I don't really care what you do. Just pay me. That's, how, that's traditional ROIC. I gave you money. What are you giving me back? This didn't work out. Make it up someplace else. That's not my problem. That's your problem. I gave you the money. It didn't work on what you did. Find something else. Okay, that's the traditional view. Here's the distinction. If you really think about the what are they doing with the money, there's two things they do with it. They either put into things, actually, their core business, or they put it into something else. And when we do a valuation, a forecast, that's going to matter. Because generally, the non-operating items are non-recurring or one-time, or don't grow at the same rate as the business. So when we forecast the numbers over time, that operating ROIC can be misleading. Right? And again, simple example, I think I even used this one in the video, but if we went to Apple, and I admit I'm an iSheep, right? here's the new Big Ten Max, here's the new watch, which I got while I was waiting in line to pick up my Ten Max, because I had a bunch of them in stock. So Apple's got about $2,000 of my money over the weekend, because <clears throat> you got to get Apple Care on top of all this other stuff. But the nice thing is it wasn't really an expensive phone, much as $70 a month. It's like buying a car, right? But here's the point. Yes. You like it? Actually, this I do because I'm old and I actually like the big screen. It's the same as the 10. It's just a much bigger screen. And what's interesting is my mom, seven years old, I bought her one. She wanted the big one. And everybody's worried like it's wide, but it's actually not that wide. Uh, but regardless, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is this ridiculously priced $1,200 phone probably cost Apple about $300. Because what they do is they buy the phone from Foxconn. And Foxconn makes the phone real cheaply for them. And they employ the people, they build the, the phone, they make all the assets, they hold all the inventory, and then they sell it to Apple for like $300. And then Apple sells it to you for $1,200 and make $900 in every phone. That's a pretty good business for very low investment. Okay? And that's the Apple model. Yes? Why would Foxconn just sell this stuff directly? Because they don't own the technology rights to sell the IP to sell in the U.S. Apple would sue the hell out of them. And U.S. government would actually probably back Apple up on that. So that's the problem. And so they can come out with a knockoff phone, but Huawei is not successful in the United States. And so Huawei is very successful in China, which is the knockoff of the iPhone, but they're not successful in the U.S. So that's the thing, IP protection for Apple. But long story short, it's, it's you know, they got them to agree to it. So it's not like Foxconn doesn't make money. It's just Apple does a lot better. Here's why this matters. If I go into Apple... And I looked at RV, which you did in your EIC assignment, and I type in custom, and I go to ROIC, and I go to the latest year, ROIC, Bloomberg ROIC, standard Bloomberg field, for the latest year. The industry average was, for this list, 15%, and Apple's making 18%. That's what you did on your assignment, right? But the problem with this is this includes both their operating and non-operating assets combined, which includes a couple hundred billion dollars of cash sitting around doing nothing. And if we grow Apple's business, the cash is probably not growing at the same rate. Plus, it's, it's a one-time thing. Like, it's separate. We're going to value it separately. So here's the thing. How much do they make when they sell a phone? Operating ROIC. And the answer is 286%. 
Every time they sell a phone, they make 286%, right? Annually, they're growing at 18% because I got a big cash hoard, right? It distorts what they're actually performing. So that's why Apple's a trillion dollar company. Like if you used 18% ROIC to value Apple and you put it through our key value drivers format, you just wouldn't get the stock price of Apple, right? So that's the point. They're generating a lot more cash flow in their business. But the problem that Apple has, they're not growing that 280% ROIC anymore. Okay, so they're valuable, but it's just not growing that fast. They could sell more iPhones, they'd be doing even better. So long story short, this is why we're doing it, right? So it's not that we're going to ignore the non-operating stuff. We're just going to forecast the operating and non-operating to grow at different rates. So in order to do that, we have to have an operating ROIC, which coincidentally does not exist in Bloomberg. Because the rest of the world doesn't use operating ROIC. They just use the lumpy one, which has combined it all together. I'm not saying it's wrong. But for a better valuation, McKinsey is suggesting, which we're doing, we did Lanny Miller, breaking it out into its components, right? That's what you just did, is you did a midterm to help you estimate an ROIC. Now we're going to use a custom formula, Bloomberg allows, to actually create a custom formula in Bloomberg that will give us operating ROIC. I saw a hand over there. Question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, I to see which company that is. That, that was, was Apple. Apple. No, 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 440.63. Oh. Uh, this one was a company called Focus Media Information. It's a Chinese company. I've never heard of them. But regardless, uh, yeah, that company. All right. So back to the story. There are two places, and again, I don't know if Bloomberg completely covered this in their training in the classroom last week because the other two classes just kind of looked at me when I said, did they talk about this? So I'm going to assume that you're just going to look at me as well. So let's talk about how to create custom fields. There's two areas in Bloomberg you can create custom fields. So think of Bloomberg as a giant cloud database but that has common fields, but they do allow individual users and individual user accounts to create your own custom fields, and you can combine custom fields and standard fields to create your own formulas. Right? So it's actually a very cool feature of Bloomberg. It lets you personalize things. You can create them in two places. One is EQS, the equity screening tool. The other is RV which is the relative valuation in the comparative tool. So we'll start out in RV. Now, in order to calculate, and I'll go to a custom template, add column, you type in to search a Bloomberg field, but if you look at this little gear icon, and you click on the dropdown, add formula is another way for saying custom field. So I'm gonna add a formula. And then these are the previous custom fields, if you have any. Now, I've been using Bloomberg for a while, so I have my own custom fields. In Bloomberg, they're now part of my Bloomberg account, which gets mixed in with the regular Bloomberg fields. So over here is where you create your equation and the custom fields associated with that. So here's what I'm going to do. Where it says field, I can click on the field list, and I can look up the Bloomberg field. Or if I know it, I could just type it in. So I'm going to take revenue. So if I take revenue, Bloomberg field, select it, and then which time period? Now, again, for consistency, we all have to have the same time periods. So we're going to use last year, latest year. Okay. So that way, and this will actually help you, anytime you pull up a company, it'll take the latest year, regardless of its fiscal year, and give you that data point. And that's a kind of cool feature of, of using a tool like Bloomberg. But what I don't want to do for grading assignments is I use latest year and you use latest filing. Because then we're going to not be looking at the same data. So very important in this assignment, everything you're going to do is going to be based on latest year. Okay? So you're going to create a custom template, and you're going to give me a data point from Bloomberg that's going to be exported on that and a better match. Otherwise, you don't get credit. Okay? So that's going to be very key to this assignment. So the, the custom field I want to create is operating cash, which we defined arbitrarily as 2% of sales versus excess cash. Because Bloomberg doesn't have the concept of operating cash and excess cash, so I'm going to put operating and excess cash into Bloomberg. So custom field, operating cash, revenue, as of the latest year, hit enter, and it gives you this, dollar sign IS010 colon Y. The dollar sign IS010 is the actual Bloomberg database field. Okay, Because Bloomberg has what's called the friendly label, revenue, and then they have the actual database field. And what I found is they will change the friendly name depending on which company you're looking at. 
So for example, if you look at a UK company, it might say turnover, because that's the term they use over the UK for revenue. If you look at the US, it might say revenue. That's why it says sales, rev, turnover. And what I found is even though these are standardized fields, they have different names depending on the company you look at, which gets really confusing. But here's the thing, whether you look at a UK company or a US company or a Hong Kong based company, all their data point is in cell IS010 in their database, arrayed by colon last year, Y minus one, Y minus two, et cetera. So that's what it does with the custom field. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply this by 0.02, 2% of revenue. So I basically take last year's revenue times 2%. I'm going to call that operating cash. So then I can either save it, or in this case, save and use. Name, op cash 201, whatever you want to call it. Something I wouldn't, you know, to put section number. Just, I'm going to be in your section. And then hit uh, name. And then immediately, there is 2% of sales for every one of those companies. And now, if I were to go back into my fields and add a column, op cash 201, listed as a custom field, is now available in Bloomberg, in either the EQS screen or the RV screen. It's not available in FA. Questions about what I just did? It's easy. It's relatively straightforward. But here's what you're going to do. To get to operating ROIC, you're going to need operating working capital. So we're going to mix Bloomberg fields and custom fields. Operating cash plus inventory plus receivables plus other current assets minus accounts payable equals or whatever it is is going to become operating operating working capital. Right? Then custom field, operating working capital. Put that together. Then operating working capital, custom field, plus net PPE plus goodwill equals operating invested capital. So suddenly we'll then create an operating invested capital. Then no plan. Bloomberg doesn't have McKinsey's no plat. Their no plat's different. They call it no plat. So our no plat, EBIT times one minus effective tax rate. Okay, no plat, custom field. Custom field, no plat. Custom field, operating invested capital. Operating ROIC. That's the first part of the assignment. Shouldn't take too long, but very important to get it right. So make sure you just get those fields typed in correctly. On the assignment for today, you'll see that you'll have to get those fields. And I'll tell you which fields I want, what the formulas I want. You just replicate it and save those fields in Bloomberg. That way, what, next time you do the EIC assignment, you actually did it to some degree based on less useful data because you did it based on industry ROIC, which includes non-operating asset performance. What we're going to do going forward is we're going to switch EIC to basically be on operating ROIC, which is a truer performance of the actual business. So again, slight nuances, but we will need these custom fields going forward. Questions? So here's how the TAs are going to grade you. Once you create all these custom fields, I'm going to give you a company. I'm going to give you a specific GIX list to replicate. You're going to basically take this screenshot with the operating uh, ROIC, and you're going to submit it, and it's going to match. And the TAs are going to pull it up, and they're going to look at your operating ROIC, and they're going to look at the solution ROIC. And if you got it right, you get the credit. If you don't, get a zero. So it's a real easy grade. All right, so hopefully, get it right. All right. Questions? All right, part two of your assignments. Starting in Monday's class, we're gonna start building the valuation model. So everyone will need Excel, and this is where we enter the Excel stage of the next few weeks. The company I've chosen for this semester is a company called Parker Hannafin. I was just working with them first time last week. To be honest with you, a few months ago, I'd never heard of them, All right? But they're a $14 billion company. They're in the Fortune 500. They've been around for a while. They basically make parts for planes, All right? So both commercial, military, et cetera, you buy they're big customers like Boeing, Airbus, et cetera. They make component parts. Big, big supplier to aerospace and defense industries, uh, amongst other things. But engineering, manufacturing. Equipment. So <clears throat> essentially, I thought it'd be kind of cool to, to value them and, and think about the valuation after doing some work with them. So long story short, we're going to do Parker Hannafin collectively as a group, and we're going to build a valuation model step-by-step step over the next four classes for Parker Hannafin. So on Monday, I'm going to give you a simple model to start with. Last semester, it was on a company called PVH. Let's go back. So if I go back to the spring, the, instead of Parker Hannafin, we did PVH. 
And the file that I gave them looked like this, would be similar to your file, except it has PVH as data. And so it has a series of tabs which go from left to right. And here's what matters. There's an income tab, which is a standardized income statement. There's a balance sheet tab, which is a standardized balance sheet. And this will have six years of Parker Hannafin's income statement and balance sheet data coming from Bloomberg in a standardized format, which is pretty cool. And that's cool because we switch it to any company and just update it with the, their data in the standardized format. Then it will feed already converted and balanced TFIs, TIIs, CFIs, and EPs. So what you did in the midterm, I have done with this file matched to standardized statements in Bloomberg. Think about how cool that's going to be. Because anytime we then put in a new company's data, not only do we have their data, we have all the economic statements converted consistently that work every time. So you don't have to do that. I would have done that for you when we start. Okay? But here's the difference. What we're going to do is we're going to do evaluation, which means we need a forecast. So what I'm going to show you how to do is to use <laughs> financial ratios. So there's about seven income statement ratios, 11 balance sheet ratios to forecast future income statements and balance sheets, which will create future CFIs, which will then turn into an economic DCF valuation of the company, which we'll use our model. We're going to build that over a series of classes. Right? So here's the deal. On Monday, we're going to start building out the forecast. At the end of Monday, I'm going to do an Excel in real time, starting with this file, and you're going to follow along. You're going to recreate exactly what I do. At the end of class, if you recreate exactly what I do, you submit, you're done. Otherwise, you have until the assignment due date to get it done. Because the next class, we're going to pick up from there, and we're going to keep going. And over a period of class, you're just going to basically recreate what I do. Right? The advantage of this is once you've all done that individually, it's not a group assignment, no sharing of files, you've got to do it yourself. That's the model you'll use to value the rest of the companies, including your group project. So it will take us two weeks to do valuation of company number one. It will take us 10 minutes to do company number two because the model is tied to Bloomberg and it can feed the data to these common statements. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. What we found out over time is Bloomberg's standard statements aren't actually standardized. Like when you go from company to company, every now and then a new field pops up for that company in their quote unquote standardized income statement and balance sheet that doesn't show up in other companies. And that's a problem. So what I had to start doing, and this took work, is I started digging through their standardized statements to figure out which actual variables in the database they were using. And every, whenever we found a new company that they were using a field that others didn't, I kind of marked it as something I needed to put in to create a standardized field. So what I did is there's this tab, which are 74 Bloomberg database fields that are a custom export to Excel of six years of historical data. And these income statements and balance sheets are mapped based on these 74 fields coming in in this specific order. So that it assumes that revenue will always be row six. It assumes that operating expenses will always be row 10. Okay. Now, in this file that you will export from Bloomberg, here's what matters. Column A, friendly name. This can be changed. And they change it a lot. Column B, database field name for Excel export. That doesn't change. Okay. So like sales revenue turnover, in this template for PVH, they call it revenue. As I said, for a UK company, sales rev turn could be called something else. Okay, so what never changes is this. All right, so when you put this template together, part two of your assignment is you need to create a reusable template saved in Bloomberg that basically matches this. It's a, it takes you 20 minutes, it's a road assignment, but it's an important assignment. So here's how it works. You will go to Bloomberg, you will go to FA for any company, You will then go to custom. You will create a custom. And here's where it says fields. And here's where you type in the data. So the first one is revenue. You start typing in revenue, Bloomberg field. But here's the problem. This is a revenue. There's a net revenue. There's a product geographic revenue. There's an ARD revenue. There's a lot of revenues. And if I choose the wrong revenue, that could be a problem. But I'm going to choose revenue. And then here's the historical revenue. 
Now, here's the thing. If I hover over it, you'll notice in white, a box pops up that says sales underscore rev underscore turn. So I know I have the right one. All right? So here's my pro tip to make your assignment easy. If you have Excel open, and you take this field, and you copy it, and you go to Bloomberg, and you go to Enter Field, and you paste it, it gives you the right one every time. Oh, sorry, hit the wrong button. It gives you the right one every time. This one, Enter. Of course, my mouse would have to work to do this. Oh, Anyhow, theoretically, when you copy and paste and hit Enter without my screwed up Mac, it's having all sorts of problems. Paste. Select the field. Be easier than hitting on her. Then it'll basically put it there. Now you know you got the right one. And that's going to matter just because there's so many permutations of very similar looking things. So here's the thing. When you're done, you're going to have a template. I have some saved templates in here. Mine is called model. Call yours whatever you want. But basically, that's the template that we'll need in our Excel file. All right. So here's the thing. You're going to export this to Excel, current template, and that is what you're going to submit as your solution. And the way the TAs are going to grade it is I'm going to give you a company to export. All right, I'm not going to tell who it is right now. And then basically, based on the export of company, I'm going to tell the TAs, check foreign exchange gains loss or uh, interest income and see if the 2017 interest income matches, 5201. And it has to match not just the number, but it has to be in that right row and column. I'm just going to give some random ones to check just to make sure that you have a matching template, right? So that's how you're going to be graded there. So it's a relatively easy assignment, okay? Final part of this is we want six annual years. Your terminal defaults to 10. So make sure you only export six periods, not 10 periods, right? Now, if you don't want to do that every time, go to settings, number of periods, six. That's the default. So every time you come to the screen, it'll just export six, right? As opposed to exporting 10, right? And then finally, because this happened to somebody before in the last class, they're like, I'm not getting this year's data. I'm getting next year's data. Be careful that Bloomberg is not where's it? I think it's under data. That none of these here are checked. He has some of these checked. So this is basically, show me the earnings estimates. Show me the common size. Show me the percentage columns. Show me the current last 12 months. Here's the problem. If you do that, you're going to have extra garbage in your Excel export. So don't have any of the extra garbage. Make sure in the data tab, none of these are checked. Update it. Now, export Excel current template. And what it's going to give me is six clean years which this file is basically the file that I just will give you an example of as a template to recreate. So that's the second part of the homework assignment. Questions? Yes, sir. How did you get that window with the periods? Which, which, when you go to here, when you go to any company, so let's go to Boeing as an example. So if I go to Boeing, <coughs> RV, or sorry, FA, financial statements, There it is, hung up here. So when you go to FA, theoretically, FA, it defaults to, and you go to custom, it defaults the number of custom periods to export. Right? Again, your standard account starts with 10. Right? But for purposes of our model, I'm only using six. Right? So that's the point. Our model is going to need six, so you're going to only export six. Right? And in here, in settings, is where you can say, oh, when I come into the screen, instead of defaulting to 10, default to 6. Oh, on the data, don't give me any of this weird stuff. I just want the math. I just want the historical data. Okay? Because Boomer can add in estimates. Boom. <coughs> Look over here. Now i got earnings estimates for the next two years right here next to my financials. Pretty darn cool, but it kills our model. So I can't have that. So don't have those things checked. Okay? So you just want clean data export. So settings... Data, uncheck, update. Now it's just six years. 
And that's the nice thing. It's the latest six years. So even if a company, like this is Boeing, if I switch to Oracle, which has a weird ending in May 31st fiscal year, then Bloomberg already knows their latest year was May 2018. And I didn't have to tell it that. So it will auto adjust for the latest year. Same thing for the operating ROIC. Okay. That's the second part of the assignment, which leads to the third part of the assignment, historical analysis. So this is where lecture note four comes in. So in lecture note four, we'll start out with McDonald's. This is called an ROIC tree. And basically what we do, what companies do, analysts do, is we tree out ROIC. Make sure it fits on the screen. So we actually understand what are called the key value drivers of a company because there are things that drive ROIC. Okay? So basically, and I don't, I don't really have a tablet to write, but I have it here on the board, or I can't see on the screen. But uh, basically, ROIC is P over I, <laughs> P over IC. If you think about just algebraically, P over S, profit over sales, times S over I equals P over I, because the S's cancel out, okay? And so if we think about just algebraically, two things explain ROIC, P over I. Margin, profit over sales, and productivity or efficiency, sales relative to investment. And that multiplication sign that ties that, that, that algebraic equation together, P over S times S over I equals P over I, says that they have equal weight. So that goes back to drivers. Two things drive ROIC. Margin, productivity. Okay. Now, the other thing that's going to affect it is tax rate. Because we have to pay taxes before we give the money to our investors. So there's the after-tax ROIC. So always three drivers... Any company that you evaluate, tax rate, pre-tax margin, operating margin, there's even margin, and productivity. Those three things explain ROIC. So that is the next part of your assignment. What explains the company's changes in their ROIC over time? Okay. So let me give an example of why we do this. And by the way, we're going to make one adjustment to that algebraic formula. So instead of saying P divided by S times S divided by I equals P divided by I, we're going to take S divided by I and do the reciprocal. I divided by S. Okay. So rather than looking at sales divided by investment, we're going to look at investment divided by sales <laughs> in our model. And it will help us for simplicity. Even though it's basically trying to say the same thing, here's how it will help us. Okay. Look at the number in, I'll go back to PVH as an example, so this is real. So look at PVH, and this is the ROIC tree that you'll eventually have in the model that we're going to build. This is the actual productivity for PVH between 2013 and 2017. And I want you to focus on this 2017 number. That is... I divided by S, invested capital, operating invested capital, divided by sales. It's 1.049. Okay? So I want you to think valuation and implications. PVH is going to grow $1 billion of revenue next year. That's our assumption. How much does PVH have to invest in its balance sheet to grow revenue a $1 billion? What's the answer? To grow revenue a billion dollars next year, how much investment does that require? I'll give you a hint. What's that number? So, therefore, a billion dollars of revenue requires a billion four forty nine million. Of spend. <laughs> See, the reason why we're taking the reciprocal, not just because it's easy, but it actually helps us we do evaluation. Because if I do a revenue forecast, 
I can do a balance sheet forecast because I'm tying how much spend I need to drive revenue. So by doing the reciprocal, we do the analysis, it actually will help our valuation. So we build our model, we just forecast sales, balance sheet's taken care of. Versus we have to separately forecast the balance sheet and hope we figure out how to do the right correlations. So again, if the company's productivity is changing over the time, that will affect our model. So here's the point. Were they better off in 2013 or were they better off in 2017 from a productivity standpoint? Which one was better? Is 0.94 better or is 1.05 better? Yeah. 2013, so they're investing less in capital than they're getting out of sales. Exactly. And that's the insight that they're investing less invested capital in sales in 2013 than they are in 2017 because they only spent 94 cents per dollar to, to drive a dollar sales in 2013. Now they're spending a dollar five to drive the same dollar sales. So that's the point. They were more productive five years ago. As a result, that increased product or decreased productivity means they're spending more cash, which is affecting their DCF valuation. So this is again the links that we're going to start to make. So in case you're wondering why you had to go through hell last week to do the damn midterm, this is what you get out of it. Right? You get more insight once you start to really get into the granular parts of this. This will make your valuations better. Right? Questions about any of this? All right, let's go back to McDonald's. This is historical McDonald's data. Right on the lecture note. So here's how you're going to start. EOI stands for end of year as opposed to beginning of year. So when you did BOI on the midterm, you did current year profit divided by last year's investment. End of year means current year's profit divided by current year investment. And I'm just labeling which one we're using. Five years worth of data. For purposes of the assignment, we're just going to look at the beginning and the end. <clears throat> now somebody asked me in the last class, they said, what about the middle? And I'm not ignoring the middle, but we're just, for purposes of this assignment, you're going to crawl before you walk. You're just going to start with the beginning and the end. Now, in future assignments, you're going to get down across all the years, and you're going to talk about what really is going on, but for now, beginning and end, just to keep it simple, okay, for this assignment. So, five years ago, McDonald's, in this example, 21.8%, 2010, 2014, 18.9. That's the ROIC, a decline of 13.6%. So, here's the key. McDonald's ROIC went from 21.8% to 18.9%. Over the last five years, a decline of 14%. It's very important when you write your paper of minimum 250 words for this assignment that you use numbers. Some of you are still pissed off at me that I made the TAs give you no credit for homework one if you didn't use numbers. Take that painful lesson and remember it as you write your next assignment. No numbers, no credit. Okay? So you can't just say McDonald's ROIC went down over a five year period by 14%. You'll get a zero for that, even though that statement is technically right. Right? Because here's the point. You could have flipped a coin. You could be 50-50 and just said it went up or down. And that doesn't mean that, that you actually understood what you said. You just guessed. And that's the problem with not using numbers. Or worse, use the wrong number and you got it right. right. So you're looking at the wrong numbers and you're not really understanding what numbers you should be looking at. So therefore, the only way I really know if you're right is if you use the actual number in the statement that supports what you're trying to say. Yes, sir? So what would you like us to say so we get like you must explain, like, why ROIC went from 21.8 to 18.9, a 13.6% decline. That's what I want you to say. And, and what I'm also telling you, you're in a suit today. Are you doing a job interview? No. Use what I'm telling you. I can't tell you. This is decades of experience. I'm getting old. I feel bad. But I will just tell you, in the real world, people have so much more credibility when they use numbers than when people that don't. And in your interviews, and I'm looking at hundreds of students across all these universities, you use numbers, you will differentiate yourself, and you will come across more credible. I was actually on the phone with PV8 this morning about a project that they're working on. I can't talk about the project, but the whole point is that what they're saying is we're going to spend some money to improve our business performance. Okay, pretty generic. But here's the thing. If that's what they said, they go to the CEO and says, I want a bunch of money to improve our business performance. He's going to be like, okay, where's your detail? But what they did is they had specific examples in their business of how they'd used a certain thing to improve their performance. They gave the anecdotes. They were very specific about what these numbers and percentages were and how they came up with the numbers. Completely credible. So I'm saying the same thing when you're on your other side of the table and you're just listening and people are using vague statements, you're, you're like, do they really know what they're talking about? It just helps you in any part of your life financially, add the numbers. People that know their numbers come across far more credibly than people that don't. 
So I'm encouraging you to do that by forcing you to do that here. So let's go back to McDonald's. Three things, always three things, drive ROIC right here on this page. And this will be the tree. And this is what you have to explain. Tax rate, margin, productivity. This times this equals that. That's algebra. And this after tax equals that. So these three things are what you will always talk about for whatever company you're working in. So let's start with tax rate. Tax rate in 2010 was 29.3% for McDonald's. Tax rate in 2014 was 35.5%. A basically increase of 21% at tax rate. So, should that have helped or hurt their ROIC? If you go from 29.9 to 35.5 tax rate, help or hurt? That should hurt it. So, part of the reason why their ROIC went down as a company is because they're paying more in taxes. Right? So, we separate that out. But is that the only reason why their ROIC went down? If we look at the actual performance of the business, the pre-tax ROIC, the operations, that went from 30.9 to 29.2. So it's a combination of paying more taxes and deteriorating performance of their operations. Now, why did the operating performance go from 30.9 to 29.2? Second and third driver. Operating margin, EBIT divided by sales. 31% in 2010, 29% in 2014. That's a 6.7% change. Did that help or hurt ROIC? EBIT margin, operating margin goes from 31 to 29. It's going to hurt. You're making two cents less, less cash profit per dollar of sales. Therefore, you're going to have less ROIC. Productivity. They spent a dollar and, and a half cent in 2010 of investment to drive a dollar sales. Now they're spending 99.1, a drop of 1.4%. Did that help or hurt their ROIC? Going from a dollar to 99. Does that help or hurt? It helped. Again, just to be very clear. A dollar means to drive a dollar sales, I spend a dollar. Now, to drive a dollar sales, I spend 99 cents. I'm spending one cent less to drive a dollar sales. That helps. So here's the thing. It wasn't the productivity there, there in balance sheet that hurt their ROIC. It was all income statement, and it was the decline in the margin and the extra taxes they had to pay. That's why their ROIC is going down. That's the analysis at what I'm calling the first level that you will do. Questions? Okay, practice. In lecture note four, go back. This is Chipotle before they became a place that kills people. So here is the data. And again, you have this in lecture note four, so you probably should have already downloaded it. Practice, same five-year period. Here's Chipotle's ROIC. These two numbers. These are the three drivers. Explain why it's changing. Take, take a minute or two. Look at the data, hopefully on your screen or on, on the big screen if you can't, don't have it up in front of you. See if you can just mentally do this yourself. Okay, and then we'll talk about it.
All right, are we uh, ready to talk about this? Somebody help me out. Anybody want to practice? Anyone want to try and practice this one? Just start the first part. Start with the end of year and help the first part. Go ahead. Um, so the ROIC, it increased in 2013 and 36.6 to 40.8. 40.8, yeah, it's hard to see on the screen. Oh, even better. So that's an increase of uh, a little less than 20 percent. Um, I got 53, but that's okay. Yeah, okay. All right, um, but keep going. So looking at what drives that, the tax rate, it decreased from 38.1 percent to 37.6 percent, which is a decrease of 1.1 percent. That hurts the ROIC. No, that should help them. If I pay less taxes, it should help my ROIC. Okay. Um, in terms of their operating margin. Stop there. What about pre-tax? Yeah, help them out. Give them assistance on pre-tax. Oh, I, I also have a question. I'm not really, I don't really understand what the pre-tax is. <clears throat> well, I'm just saying that if you take your pre-tax profit times one minus tax rate, you get your after-tax profit. So when we look at ROIC, we're looking at after-tax profit. Right? But there's two parts of that. It's pre-tax profit times one minus tax rate. So we're breaking them into two different components. So we're looking at one driver of taxes and one driver of the actual level of profit. That's the two here. Yes? Um, yeah, 52.2, or this one, 26.6 to 40.8, yeah. I don't know, 48 divided by 26 divided by 26 should be around 50. I don't know. Looks like it's a little off. I think you're right. It's a little off. But the point is, 40.8 40. minus 26 divided by 26. Oh, okay. So that should be 53.3%. Okay. So, but here's the point. This is the key to pre-tax ROIC. So just go back to his point on pre-tax ROIC. What's, what does that tell you? Which of these two Pre-tax ROIC or tax rate increase was the most important to the after-tax ROIC going up. Did the after-tax ROIC go up because they're paying a lot less in taxes? Or did the ROIC pre-tax really drive it? Which one of those two were more important? Yeah. Um, the pre-tax is more important. Um, the ROIC is more important. Just stop right there. That's the insight I want you to have. All right, so I just want to separate out, okay, is taxes changing this? Yes, it is. But is that the real reason it's changing? Because taxes are changing? Or is it the underlying business? It's clear for Chipotle that paying less in taxes is actually helping them a little bit. But what's really helping them is their business just getting a lot better. That's the insight. Everybody see that? Okay. Now we can talk about margin and productivity. I just wanted to just stop you there to make sure we didn't pass that before we understood that. Okay. So this is the second and third driver. What's going to drive the pre-tax? What's going to drive the actual performance of the business? Was it their margin? How'd the margin do? Somebody else jump in on this one. EBIT margin, operating margin. That help or hurt the ROIC? All right, you got a thumbs up? Say that in a statement. Okay. I can't remember. I have numbers here. Um, I, and it's hard to see. So, uh, operating margin increased from 0.157 to 0.173. Mm -hmm. 2010 to 2014, which is helpful. Okay. And can you see the next one, the productivity? Um, which one? Invested capital divided by sales. Can you see uh, those numbers? Yeah. So this, um, so I think this one, based off what you said last time, um, also helps. Yes, the lower, lower is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I see that you're, you're nodding your head. Can you put that in a statement for him? <coughs> okay, <laughs> no easy the numbers. Um, so basically, they invest um, less because they're paying a lot of savings. So use numbers. Uh, so before they invested, what, 36? 0.5. 0.5. But now they invest 26.4. Just don't forget what she just said. Yeah. Because I'm saying what he said is exactly right. And I know he's right. And I'm looking at him. I'm hearing him. I can see his body language. I just see he looked at the numbers. I can tell he had a right answer. 
when a TA is grading this on a computer screen and they're just looking at text, they have no idea how you actually put that statement in unless you added what she added and then you can actually see, oh yeah, this is the numbers they're referring to. They must be actually knowing what they're saying. Makes a huge difference and is required for the class, by the way. So again, those three things explain, but look at, look at the two. Which of those two, margin or productivity, which of those two improved their ROIC more? All three of these helped, which is pretty good. But which of those improved it the most? Tax rate, margin, invested capital to sales. What do you think? It's probably the invested capital to sales. So that's the point. It was really the productivity of the stores. So let's go back, and I was telling the last classes, you know, a few years ago, go to 2013, 14, I remember being at Chipotle in a line. It's the only thing I remember about Chipotle, lines. No matter what time of day, no matter what store you went to, it was a long line. Right? And then they had E. coli and you know, just tried to kill people and do some bad things. Now there's no lines. Right? But before the E. coli scare, basically Chipotle was a great stock. Everybody loved them. And this is exactly why. Look at this. They were growing their business rapidly. Their productivity was actually getting better. They didn't have to spend as much to grow. And their margins were getting better as they sold more stuff. And they were paying less taxes as they sold more stuff. For, from a Wall Street perspective, this is like the perfect stock. And they had a great run-up in their stock price during this period of time. And you can see why, right? So unlike McDonald's during the same period of time, which wasn't growing, they were having trouble and you could see it because their productivity wasn't changing and their margins were under pressure. So again, just the story of two different companies. Right. Questions about this? How are we doing on time? Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna give you one more chance and you're gonna only be able to see this online because you don't have this in front of you. But this is PVH from last year. So I'm going to shrink this down a little bit. So last semester, this was our common company that we valued. It's just like we're going to do Parker Hannafin this, this semester. So you look at all this data. Here's the, if you can see on the big screen, this is the tree. Is it big enough to see? Generally, hopefully. Okay. So take a look at this and let's see what's been going on with PVH. PVH, by the way, again, is the brand owner for Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger globally. That's PVH. So they're a clothing company. So we're looking at 2013 against 2017. And just kind of look at it, practice yourself, just so that when you hear the answer, you at least thought it through. Because this is how you're going to do your assignment. Mm -hmm. So when we're doing our assignment, do you want us just to write the one branch that we're following or do you want to describe like all of them? Well, I want you to kind of treat it almost like a Mad Lib. you got to talk about all three parts of this as what's called the first level analysis. And then what's coming next is this is going to be driven by these three things. So you're going to have to talk about that too. This is going to be driven by these three things. You have to talk about too. But that's where we're going next. But before we go there, we're just talking about these three things. These affect that. And when I say three, it's tax rate, invested capital sales, operating margin. Affect that. So what can we say about PVH? Start with the overall ROIC. Went from what to what? 9.2 to 7.5? A decline, so worse off. Why? Was it taxes? Did taxes contribute to the decline in the company's ROIC? I heard yes, but I'm seeing 20 to 19, and that seems like less taxes would actually help. So it's not the tax rate. So tax rate went from 21 to 19.6, to decline to 7.5%. So it wasn't the tax rate that was contributing to their client. The tax rate was actually favorable. So it was all operations, because their pre-tax ROIC went down. It went from 11.6 to 9.2, a drop of 21%. So margin, store productivity, what hurt them? Did the margin... Help or hurt them? Pre-tax margin, EBIT margin. That hurt. Went from 10.9 to 9.6. 12% decline in their operating margins. Pressure over time in their margins. Productivity went from 94 to 105. That help or hurt? <coughs> hurt. They're now spending almost 10 cents per dollar more to sell the same stuff, and they're making 2 cents per dollar less when they sell it. And that, together is hurting their pre-tax ROIC. 
And if you think about it, these things, these two things are about the same. They're having about the same amount of impact. At the same time, they're not getting their growth in productivity investments. They're spending a lot, and they're not getting the same amount of sales. They're also getting less than every sale. And you put that together, it's just putting pressure on their business. Go back and look at a five-year uh, price chart of PVH. You'll see them underperforming the industry in the five-year S&P 500 index. That's why. It's just a tough time for them in the business. All right. So long story short, <laughs> second level analysis. These three things, and I'll do it on this screen. Actually, I'll do it on McDonald's. Go back to McDonald's. Uh, these three things, gross margin, SG&A, depreciation, are the income statement items that give you EBIT or operating margin. Okay, So basically, this minus this minus this equals that. that that's basically just the income statement. Right? So that's the point. What in the income statement caused their operating margin to decline 2%? Was it their gross margin? Was it their SG&A spend? Was it their depreciation? Which of those three combinations drove operating margin? That's what I call the second level of analysis. And that's what we also have to do. So here's the thing. Gro one thing. This gross margin has been modified to exclude depreciation. Because typically a lot of companies put cost of goods sold and depreciation together. Depreciation is part of cost of goods sold. So this one strips cost of goods sold from depreciation. So depreciation is broken out separately. So this minus this minus this equals that, just to keep it consistent. Okay. So here's the point. Gross margin, 45 to 61. It's a pretty big jump. SG&A, 9 to 26. That's also a pretty big jump. Almost doesn't make sense to have that big a jump in both. Matter of fact, let's look at this. Gross margin. 45, 45, 62, 62, 61. SGA, 9, 8, 25, 25, 27. Something seems amiss. What's the answer? Yeah. Did they have something made, uh, major happens in the financials between 2011 You would think so, but it's actually not that at all. It's something worse in my mind. Yes. I, well, here's what I consider worse. It's the accountants. You accounting majors out there, this is how you make all your money. You create all this work for yourselves. They reclassified stuff. Reclassification. Things that used to be cost of goods sold now are in SGNA. Things that used to be in SGNA are now cost of goods sold. They reclassified all their statements. Well, it screws me up because now I don't have consistent statements going back financially. All right? So I can pay more money for you to give me that. All right? So again, it's your fees. That's what pays the jobs here. That's how you get the $80,000 starting salaries. But back to this, gross margin, SGA depreciation, that's the problem. We are looking at apple and orange. So sometimes he's right. Sometimes it really is the company had a big problem. But I don't think that's McDonald's. So McDonald's was restructured. And this is the danger of the real world. Like, you're going to run across this, and you're going to be like, how do I do a five-year analysis when I have an apple and a pear? So what I probably have to do is the three-year analysis. So let's look at the last three, because these are at least look like like versus like. Gross margin... 61, or sorry, 62, 62, 61. Better or worse? Slightly worse. SGNA, 25, 25, 26 and a half. Depreciation, 5, 6, 6. <coughs> worse. Spending more in depreciation, spending more in SGNA, slightly low gross margin, all three contributing to the decline in the operating margin in the last three years, 31, 2 to 29. So really, the two cent decline primarily be, was between the last two years. And primarily, it was the gross margin SGA, but all three of those were unfavorable. All right? Now, what about the balance sheet? Working capital plus PP&E plus goodwill is invested capital. That's operating invested capital. These are the three components of operating invested capital you could do custom fields on that you just did the conversion on them in your midterm exam. You add these three things, you get that. Generally, lower is considered better. Operating working capital went from negative two cents to zero. That's actually better. When you go from more negative to less negative, you spent money. So it actually means it's worse. They spent two more cents on working capital, rounding off. PP&E to sales went from 91.6 to 89. That was actually good. They got good store productivity. 
intangibles 11 to 10 that helped so if you really want to look at what hurt their invested capital to sales it was working capital they went from more negative to less negative basically if you have negative working capital it means you probably have suppliers that you're not paying accounts payables bigger than accounts receivables okay or inventory right so that's the point of negative working capital you usually have more liabilities than assets so you're basically relying on your suppliers to finance your business eventually you got to pay them. so but just generally McDonald's has less negative working capital, which means they're probably paying them, as a result <coughs> that it's closer to zero. Right? Lower is generally considered better, but nonetheless, an increase is explained the drop in productivity. Look at Chipotle. Again, I'll give you a second. Look at their, what I'll call second level analysis. Look at those numbers for the income statement, the drive operating margin. Look at those numbers that drive the balance sheet, invested capital to sales, and let's try and figure out why their margin's improving, why their productivity is improving on a more granular level using those sub-level drivers. Everybody have a everybody have an answer for that, or at least you kind of thought through it. So for Chipotle operating margin, and again I'm gonna I'll make it a little bit bigger even on this screen, so we can focus in on it. Why did this operating margin increase by 1.6 percent percentage points? Which of the income statement drivers impacted that? Was it gross margin? Gross margin help that? Yes or no? Actually, no. Because it went gross margin went 30.4 to 29.9. If nothing else, that half cent decline should hurt them. SGNA went from 11 to 10, 11 to 99. That helped or hurt? That hurt? Helped. Oh, sorry, helped. And depreciation went from 3.8 to 2.7. That helped. So it's depreciation SGNA. Those declines offset a little bit of a margin decline, but basically, they're, and that's again back to the, the value of Chipotle. Like at some point, Chipotle didn't have to do as much advertising. Open a store, people just showed up, bought a lot of burritos, right? Or bowls or whatever they call them these days. But the point is, that was the thing. They were actually the ideal investment on the income statement because they didn't have to spend a lot of marketing to get the growth. Some companies had to kind of put the brand out. They had the brand. They were growing it. What about the balance sheet? Invested capital divided by sales. Working capital. Better or worse? Is that better or worse? To ROIC. It's going to help. They went from negative 1.6 cents to zero. That's actually worse. It's not better. Again, you got to deal with negative numbers. Less negative means more investment. Okay? Now, more positive means more investment, too. But regardless, so that's the point. Working capital actually hurt their productivity. They probably had more inventory because they had more stores. And they were getting into more types of food and fresher food. So they had to keep more on hand because you got to have it, you know, you might have to throw some stuff out too. But here's the point. PP&E sales is also more expensive because they're going to organic stuff. Uh, PP&E sales, 36.9 to 26.9. That was the game. That was the PP&E is, is the stores. That's the store productivity. That's where Chipotle was really shining because they're spending 10 cents less per dollar on property plant equipment over time. And, and intangibles were acquisitions. They went from one cent to half a cent. That helped as well, but not as much as the, the PP&E sales. So again, think about how we can now trail this through, is that basically it was the PP&E sales and the improved SG&A ratio that were the primary drivers of ROIC improvement at Chipotle. 
Right? And that's what we can eventually tie together after we've done the whole story. But individually, you will walk this through. And again, it's almost, I like to call it almost like a Mad Lib, because you can go through every company this way, and the more you do it, you'll get more sensitized to being able to do it with numbers. But then here's the thing. We do the valuations, this will help us. Right? Because again, think about it just very simplistically. I gotta forecast inventory for a company. How do I do it? Well, if I know that Chipotle has this level of working capital sales pretty consistently, then that's the point. Tell me what the sales are, percentage, boom, inventory done. Tell me what the sales are, boom, pp and &E. I can figure out CapEx. Now, Chipotle becomes tricky because does this slide actually continue or does it level off at some point? Okay, so that's where the art of valuation will eventually come in. But nonetheless, this, these ratios will help us when we do our forecast. That's why we will forecast ratios rather than absolute numbers when we actually start the building the model next week. Yes, sir. So working capital is already negative and it gets less negative. You said that's bad because they're spending more money. I'm just saying that on a relative basis it's bad. Now maybe it's good in that they needed to spend the money in order to drive future sales. So there could be a business reason, but purely financial. If you just think about the formula for ROIC, more I and the same level of S is just worse for your ROIC. So I'm just saying, if you just look at it just purely on the mathematical model, more is worse. That's the way I'm looking at it. But again, we're taking out the business context. We're just looking at financial context. So that's actually a good point he's bringing out. Like maybe it's actually good that they're doing this because they're actually building necessary things to support future growth. And that's what we would ask them. So this is the analyst on the conference call. You know, hey, whatever from Merrill Lynch, you're up. And that's your question. Oh, we noticed that you're spending more on working capital. Is this to support some growth or are you actually having some supply chain challenges? That's where the analysts come up with those questions, right? Because then I get the nuance about what I then think in my model as I forecast this forward. Good question. Excellent question, excellent. Other good questions? Any other questions? All right, so let me summarize. The assignment hasn't been posted yet. I won't post it until later today, right? But basically, three parts, All right? Number one, custom operating ROIC formula. Number two, custom Excel template to export model data. Number three, explain an ROIC tree that I will give you. Write it up 250 words or more, and basically refer to numbers as you go through it, just like we have done, All right? Just, it'll be one company, one tree, that's all you're gonna have to do. And just beginning and end. You don't have to worry about the middle on this assignment. Later assignments, the middle matters. This assignment, beginning and end. Yes, sir. And the due dates for those three? Monday, 10 a.m. All Monday? All Monday. And then Monday, come prepared with Excel, either on one of these computers or preferably your own laptop, because we're going to start building the Parker Hannafin valuation model. That'll be the next couple assignments after that. Okay, should get fun. Good luck. Have a good weekend. See you on Wednesday, Monday.